Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and joining me, as always, the warden of Nassau County. It's John. John, we're getting down to the wire with these character reviews. Yeah. We got four down. Or wait, right? Four with down. The we got four more to go. Four to go. This is the midway point. And I think it's a good character for the midway point. It's a character not only that I like and you like. Probably the most consistently loved character. You think more so than Tyrion Lannister? It's neck and neck, I think. See, here's the difference I see. As a viewer and a reader, as both, I think Ari is a more likable character. If you really read the books, mm-hmm. I, th- I think what happens with Tyrion is everyone loves Peter Dinklage. The character gets overhyped, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean. He does, although I will say in the first two seasons, especially in Winter is Coming, which, by the way, I tried to get my father to watch Winter is Coming. And he just couldn't do it? You know what it was? It was 9.30 at night. You yeah, know, we had, we had gone out to you know. eat a few beers and he couldn't pay attention to the characters. Next thing I know, he's nodding off. Yeah. When I was watching, I was trying to watch from a first timer's point of view, which is hard enough, but it is confusing. And the thing with Tyrion is of all these characters you meet in the first season, he's the most recognizable and he's funny and he really grounds the entire and I'm just talking strictly Game of Thrones, the TV show. He grounds the entire series. That sense of humor in this in this weird world brings it home for you. So I think that's what Tyrion has going for him in the first couple seasons. But as you were just saying, there is a difference in character between A Song of Ice and Fire Tyrion and Game of Thrones Tyrion. That's what you were alluding to, yes. right? Is, is, yeah. He's done some dark things in the past. It's... It's not that surprising. They've coded him in ways they've coded maybe, like so we've talked about in the Jamie episode, where they, they coded the Red Wedding, and they, they pluralized it just to last, just in the regard to the books. They've coded some things with him, not to make him out as uh, selfish and out for himself and the things that he does for himself in the books. And a lot of his plans in the, in the show, though, they, he really... Shits the bed. Yeah. <laughs> Especially... As official hand. Yeah. I feel like, like, yeah. He, he did a better job, better job acting as acting can. hand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With the mm-hmm. pressure's off, you know, <laughs> that pressure's on. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about Tyrion today, but the, the <laughs> thing about it, yeah, we should, we should save it for the Tyrion podcast, but I'll just say quickly, as acting hand, he's serving his nephew, his sister, his family. He's fighting for his family, making decisions for his family. As official hand to Daenerys, he's fighting against his family. And he's making better decisions as acting hand for his family than he is as official hand against his family. Conspiracy theory. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. So how did that, how did we get on Tyrion? Oh, the universally loved characters. Yeah. Does everybody love Jon Snow? I think everybody likes Jon Snow. Does everybody love him as much as they love Tyrion? I don't think so. I think Tyrion is more universally loved. And I think Arya comes pretty close. I would give it to Tyrion, though, in the TV show, strictly speaking. But Arya is right up there. And Arya is also Paris Martin's favorite character, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Have you heard that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. It said he, he would leave her, uh, George if he would kill kills her off. John, where, where do you put Arya in your favorite character's TV show alone? T- uh, Top 10? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, I might like her more in the books. Mm-hmm. Only because her chapters in the first three books, especially books two and three, are just so Oof. awesome. Yeah. And they kind of go downhill, kind of like how seasons five and six already go downhill a bit. Yeah. So her chapters yeah. in books four and five. And that's something we'll definitely touch on today mm-hmm. is her journey away from Westeros. Um, and we don't have her journey back from Bravos 
in A Song of Ice and Fire. It's uncharted territory for Benioff and Weiss. It all is now. But D and D original picture. Original yeah, it really joint. is original joint by D and D with Arya's. I feel like her time in Bravos was pretty far off from what Martin did write about it. Where have we left with Arya in A Song of Ice and Fire? She was blind oh, at the end of A Feast for Crows, and the few chapters we get of her in A Dance there with Dragons. There wasn't many, right? In A Dance with Dragons no. with her, there wasn't many. No, if, if I remember correctly. No, because A Dance with Dragons. It runs parallel to A Feast for Crows for the first two-thirds of the book, I believe. And then the last third of the book is everybody. Once yeah, again. it catches up. It's kind of like a, a highway joining mm-hmm. into one road. Perfect analogy. Two, two highways, really excuse me, joining into one highway. But, of course, you can't do that on television. I thought maybe you could. And there's things about the books, the Theon as Reek reveal. Mm-hmm. Looking back, yeah, they can't really do that. I, I, I hate to... You know, sound like a D and D apologist, but to be fair, a little bit, I think it would be very hard for them to really translate her stuff and the books to the show and the time frame that they had. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with you there. It's very tedious. It's I don't want to say tedious, but it's very. Um, you talking about the book material? Yeah, book material. There, there's a lot of stuff going on that I think it's just very tough to really explain. Mm -hmm. Well, there's also her warging ability and her own green dreams that she has in the books, which they don't even touch that in the TV show. I understand that because it's a whole nother element. Well, they didn't even touch John's warging abilities. They really just kept that as as Bran. Kept it at Bran. I can understand all that, especially if these abilities don't play much into the end game of A Song of Ice and Fire. And maybe they do. And Benioff and Weiss just felt that they could cut it out entirely. It being another complicated element, not only that, but a supernatural element at that, it does make more sense. That's okay that you're a Benioff and Weiss apologist as far as Arya, but there is one part of what they did which doesn't sit well with me, and I I don't think it sits well with you either, and that's her fighting ability, the skills that she has now, and I'm talking where she absolutely housed Brienne of Tarth on the practice yard and what we've seen of her in the trailer for season eight. It's cool. It's great. But it was almost like a surprise. We knew she was practicing with the waif. We knew she was learning how to assassinate people. But this fighting ability she has, you know, suddenly she's Uma Thurman from Kill Bill. And Mm -hmm. I didn't see that coming. It's a little overkill. Yeah, it's a little much. And it will be great to see her fighting against the Whites and the White Walkers in season eight. It will be great to see her fighting knowing that she can do that, but her being able to do that and trouncing a knight of the Rainbow Guard, that didn't sit well with me. So I feel like they could have made her training in Bravos. So you saw her developing these skills, even a couple scenes. Because even in her training, just pretty much still always the waif getting the upper hand, that all of a sudden she cuts the candle and she defeats the waif. Right. We didn't really even see her succeed against the waif up until... She actually kills her. But then, of course, you listen to the theories that the R we see now is actually still the wave, and R we struck is actually dead. How pissed off would you be if that's the case? Could you imagine? <laughs> oh, my God. Could you imagine? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That would be... <laughs> imagine if all these theories are true that these people have. R is dead. That's actually the wave. Rhaegar's alive. He's Mance Raider. But, you know, he's dead. Littlefinger's still alive. Like, all these things come to play in Season 8. Arya Stark... I definitely put her in my in my top ten book characters. Book, I put her in a top five. I think TV really? show, I think it's more like top ten. I think she falls down a little bit. Yeah, she does. Where do you put the emphasis on that falling down? Do you put it on the writing or do you put it on Macy Williams, the actress? Uh, the writing, I guess you can say. I didn't really enjoy the Bravo stuff. I mean, I was expecting more. Uh, we, we we discussed, you know, you just discussed it right now, the... The fighting skill. We, we, we pimped her out to be a better fighter than John. We're, we're always finding ways to have someone help John out in one on ones. But for Arya, you know, she can defeat someone who's uh, twice her size in uh, Brianna Tarth. Yeah, man. Like I said, if we saw that she was working and learning how to do these spins and all these tricks and kip ups, if we saw her learning these things, it'd be a different story. But to not see any of that, there really wasn't much training. It was all like mental manipulation from the waif and Jock and Hagar trying to convince her she's no one. 
there was really no physical fighting lessons, unless unless I'm wrong, but I don't recall any of that. Well, it's, it's again, it's not even so much that there's no no final lessons. There was definitely some you know training she had, but she never won any of this damn stuff. She never you never saw her really progress. Yeah, and then also in the case she comes to Westeros, and all of a sudden she's this great fighter. Well, we'll get to it, but yeah, a lot of lot of problems for me with season that was season six mostly that horrible gut wound. Yeah. Like, if she knew how to fight the way she can fight in Season 7, I feel like she should have made short work of the Waif. I mean, the, the way it stands now, like, if her and the Waif teamed up, like, they could just, <laughs> you know, run through everybody in Westeros and win the Iron Thrones themselves. But going back to Season 1, she's just a cute little kid, Arya. She's what we would have called a tomboy 10 years ago, but I don't know if that's politically correct anymore to call somebody a tomboy. We first see her, she's doing needlework with Sansa, and she is not enjoying herself at all. No. She hears the boys out in the practice yard shooting, well, it's Bran who's shooting arrows at a target with Rob and John, urging him on. Rickon's just sitting on a, I don't even know what he's sitting on, but enjoying the sunshine, I guess. It's John that tells Bran to focus. Bran looks like he's about to make the shot, and then Arya hits the bullseye from behind him. Mm. Good introduction to the character, or no? Uh, yeah. I think, yeah. I, I think it's a good intro to, like, you know, what she really wants to be. Yeah, I think I think it was a great introduction. Then Bran runs after her. I've said it a million times, and I think you've agreed with me. The Stark interactions in Winter is Coming, really the interactions with everybody in Winter is Coming, the importance of that, because a lot of those characters are going to be separated shortly after and not reunite until a few of them last season, more important ones this coming season. And it was so vital to establish who these characters were around one another. Kudos to Benioff and Weiss for writing Winter's Coming. Granted, it was their second try at it, but kudos to them for... <laughs> That's one thing I would love to see, is the unaired pilot. I would love to see that. They should really release that somehow, like, mm -hmm. the Saturday before the last episode. Yeah, right? Just for fun. Just for kicks. So when Ned is named Hand to the King, and he decides to go to King's Landing to set up his household there and to serve Robert and to try and figure out who killed John Aaron. Arya and Sansa, it's decided they're both going to go with him to King's Landing, along with Bran. Obviously, Bran doesn't make it, so it ends up being Arya and Sansa that travel with their father to King's Landing. We know Sansa's real excited at the prospect of being at the center court, so to speak, mm -hmm. being at the royal court, pageantry, the tournaments. Do we get an idea that this is exciting for Arya? The journey... The idea of adventure, of change. Of if I remember correctly, I don't think she's that happy, no? Isn't she a little bit like who yeah, cares that we're going down south? Yeah, that's the way she comes across. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's really explored whether she doesn't want to go and she wants to stay at Winterfell. But knowing the character that she is, I feel uh -huh. like she would want to stay at Winterfell. I feel like she wouldn't want to go to King's Landing. Obviously, everything that happens looking back, she wouldn't want to go. But I think at the time, the journey itself was the adventure for her. Whether she was excited about it or not, things take a turn pretty quick on the way to Winterfell. Be, um, on the way to King's Landing, rather. Before I think we should get into that, let's just, I think we should make, at least I would like to make a, um, a, 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 a needle. A needle. I, I yeah, love you're that right. scene you're to right. this day. And yeah, you're right. That, that scene between John and Arya is just so, and I think they did very well in the, in the show as well. They just really hit home that they were really close. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it is that they're so close? Well, I, I think it comes down to, you know, John, obviously John's the outsider. Right. And I think the way Arya presented herself to be, you know, being this girl, especially with Sansa, she was, you know, as we said before, she was the town boy. She's the one who wanted to be a fighter. She, you know, she didn't care to be all clean and proper. Mm -hmm. she, she herself would also be kind of the, uh, the oddball in a way. Oh, you're right. Yeah. So I no, think you, I, you they, they just on. really connected there outside of the physical appearances of that, you know, that they kind of resemble each other. Well, t yeah, TV show, they don't really, they don't really go there. But, no. In the, um, in the books, the whole entire thing is, you yeah. know, that Arya and John look alike. Arya resembles Liana. So if John and Arya look alike, then, and Arya and Liana, then John looks like it's Liana. Yeah. All the other Stark kids have that dopey Tully look to them. Stupid Tully. <laughs> I think you nailed it. John always feels like an outsider. He can't help it. He's the bastard child of Ned Stark, and Arya is not ever going to conform to the standards of a noble lady. So she's an outsider also. 
And just their connection, you know, they always, you know, John would always call her a little sister. Mm-hmm. And muss her hair. Mm-hmm. John gives her needle and needle turns out to be a very important part of her life mm-hmm. in her journeys. It's the only thing that she is able to take with her from King's Landing. She almost loses it a few times, but it's kind of like Indiana Jones's hat. She always, yeah, she always gets it back before she moves on to the next place. She gets needle and she's excited about it. So she's practicing needle on the way to King's Landing. She's practicing her, what she calls her needlework, her sword play. And she's practicing with this poor bastard, Micah, <laughs> the butcher's boy who doesn't know what he's in for. <laughs> you know? Oh. <laughs> Oh, you poor, you poor slob. You don't even know. <laughs> You're in way over your head right now. He's like, oh, nice. I'm, I'm playing swords with Noble. Uh, right. Yeah. It's as high as you're going to get right now. <laughs> because the low is coming. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's all going to come crashing down around you. So a few things happen here which really affect Arya. It feels like a scene that we've talked to death. It feels like a scene that everybody knows pretty well in the fandom. But it is such a vital scene because it creates a huge divide between Sansa and Arya. All right, yeah, and, a further divide. Mm-hmm. You know that term, you see a baby and older women will say, you know, she's an old soul. Sometimes you look at a baby's eyes and you get the idea that they're wise beyond their years, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Where Sansa's all naive. Yeah, well, everything's great. Whereas Arya right away, she can tell what Joffrey is and she can tell who Queen Cersei is. And that whole experience really sours. It sours her view of the royal family. And I don't know, do you think it it affects her view to the point where she's not cynical, but she's realistic in what she's experiencing? I I think it's, how do I want to say this? Like, she's more like, she's definitely more inclined to like, to knowing that this, this last of people are just no good. They're not someone that we we really should be with, be around with. Father's right. You know, Edward would never like the lasses. What's interesting is Ned isn't vocal about that to his kids. Yeah. Later on, later on in season one, he is when he, he wants to send them back to Winterfell. Right, because we've come to a dangerous place. We'll find a man who's worth having you, Sansa. I want Joffrey. He's nothing like his father. Yada, yada. He's playing like he's worse than his father. <laughs> Even in that scene when Sansa's talking about Joffrey, Arya's looking at him like, like are you crazy? Yeah. Like, you spend more time with him. How could you not see what he is? And I think that it's interesting that Arya is of the mindset of Ned. And yet neither one of them have discussed their thoughts on Joffrey, their thoughts on Queen Cersei. They both reached the same conclusion about these people. Ned obviously has more experience with the Lannisters, but Arya's short time with the Lannisters, she would agree wholeheartedly with Ned. And yet Ned's never tried to sway her opinion about the royal family one way or the other. So along those lines, John, I, I get why you consider Arya really the only true Stark that's left because John is the Targaryen, and Sansa's, maybe she becomes more like Ned, but Sansa and Bran take more like their mother and their mother's behaviors than they are like Ned, mm-hmm. whereas Arya is the closest to Ned of all the Stark kids in personality and characteristics. You agree with that, right? Mm-hmm. So this sparring contest with Micah, Joffrey and Sansa are going for a walk. Joffrey comes across Micah and Arya practicing swords. He wants to play the bully. They get into a scuffle. Arya disarms him. And then Nymeria shows up. Arya knows that Nymeria is doomed. She runs off with Nymeria. And it's real sad that she throws rocks right. and tells Nymeria to leave. It's kind of heartbreaking for a dog lover. Mm-hmm. Going then to season seven, when she sees the direwolf that she believes is Nymeria. You have no question that that was uh, Nymeria. That's definitely Nymeria. Will that come into play in season eight? I hope it does. Well, that, but then in a way, I don't. Because you know, Nymeria will die just with ghosts and they'll become like witted wolves or something. I really hope that's not the case. Do you think that's possible? Yeah. I mean, there's, only, there's only two dire wolves left. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's, they're, they're, <laughs> one of them's got to, at least one of them has to make it. You would think. You would think. It's Jory that finds Arya, even though Lannister men are also searching for her. Stark men are searching for her. Luckily for Arya, it's Jory that finds her. She's brought before the king without Ned being made aware that she's oh, gone. He was pissed. Yeah. In, pissed. Uh, now, in the show, do they. Do they stress how long she was gone? Because it was a few nights in the book. You know, it was a few days that she was gone. No, I don't um, think so. They just when Ned comes in, he's like, How come no one told me? You know, where yeah. is she? Why wasn't yeah. I informed? Like just really like frantic. And Robert, not wanting to make any decision at all, says, Oh, we thought it best to get this matter done with And then Cersei's there. Ugh. The Lannisters test Sansa. They put her in the middle. 
Robert asks Sansa. Like a true Tully, she can't tell the truth. I know that's a strike in your book for Sansa. For me, it's a, eh, you kind of give her a pass. I think we talked about that with Sansa. Yeah, there are no passes. Arya is certainly not giving Sansa a pass. As soon as Sansa says she can't remember, Arya's liar, liar. Does she physically attack Sansa? I think she was for like a slap at least or something. Yeah, Jory has to hold her back. Yeah, Arya is pissed. Arya is pissed. But she thought ahead. Her throwing rocks at Nymeria. Her telling Nymeria yeah. to run off. I think when I first saw that, like, why is she, I didn't, I didn't realize that this is the, you know, the, <laughs> the last would want to kill the title. But then, like, you know, you kind of like, oh, okay, that's smart thinking. Yeah. But then you don't realize the <laughs> the curveball that Cersei throws on a three zero count with bases loaded. Right. You think everything's gonna be okay? It's like, oh, we still have another wolf. Well, for Cersei, the whole thing is a power play against Ned. That's what the whole thing is. It's not yeah, about Joffrey make, getting bit. Yeah. It's not about- Just make them suffer somehow. I don't think it's even revenge for her. I think it's a power move against and Ned they, and, and to show it, him who the boss is. Yeah, it's not revenge. It's more like excitement. It's more like real life people who just hurt animals in real life. Maybe, maybe. I think it's more a sparring contest with Ned. We know that Cersei wants power. She wants regency on her own life. But not only that, she wants to be able to do what her father does because she feels she's quite capable of doing what her father does. So a new political player comes into the fold and it is Ned Stark who has no patience for the Lannisters. And no political game. (laughs) And no political game whatsoever. Cersei doesn't know that yet. That's why she does this and, and Ned just accepts the sentence. So King Robert decides no punishment for Arya, but a direwolf has to go down. And Sansa, she doesn't lie. She doesn't tell the truth. She omits the truth, which I guess is as bad as lying. She gets hers. It's Lady that has to be put down in place of Nymeria. So Ned, Arya, Sansa, they arrive at King's Landing with no direwolves. We know there is something to what Catelyn was saying about the direwolves protecting the Stark kids. These Starks are going straight into the Viper's Nest without their direwolves to protect them. Arya starts training with Cyril Pharrell. We know that Ned hired Cyril Pharrell. Does he say who it was that suggested Cyril Pharrell? Uh, in the show? Yeah, in the show. I can't remember. I feel like in, in the books it was, uh, and I forget the guy's name, the man in arms, the, the guy that runs the practice yard. He ends up dying in the, in the uh, bread riots. In a Clash of Kings, but he suggests Ciro Pharrell to Ned in a Game of Thrones. There is a strong theory that Ciro Pharrell is Jack and Hagar. Mm-hmm. It's a theory that will never be proved one way or another. His death is off screen in both the books and in the TV show, so we don't even know if it's if it's a death. What do you think? I'm gonna lead towards him being Jagged Hagar. You think so? Mm-hmm. I could buy it. The only thing I, I would say against him being Jack and Hagar is the King's Guard, whoever it is in season one, that King's Guard is still alive. So if it is Jack and Hagar, he either escaped, changed his face, or he was caught, put in the black cells. But I, I don't think that they would have put him, I think they would have just killed the guy. Mm-hmm. That's true, but I don't know. But one scene I really love in season one, maybe it's episode four. I'm not really too sure, but it ends with Ned watching as Arya trains mm-hmm. with Cyril Pharrell. Water dancing, they call it, right? Mm-hmm. And Ned's watching it. In the background, you hear the sounds of war. So while Ned's watching Arya train, he's got this almost like a proud smile on his face. And we know Ned doesn't smile too much. Then it, it, it fades away real quick as you hear the sounds of, of war, of people yelling, swords clanging. You know, horses galloping. You hear that in the background, and you know that Ned is thinking of Robert's rebellion and all of the horrible things that he experienced while at war. Great acting on Sean Bean's part, and it was something I didn't pick up the first time. Benioff and Weiss are able to utilize scenes like that, since they don't have they don't have the the luxury of the point of view chapter, the monologue where Ned is actually having this memory. Mm-hmm. I think that goes a long way to establish what Ned's thoughts of war and his experience during the War of the Usurper, the long-term effect that those experiences have had on him. Do you give Ned credit for 
coming to the conclusion that Arya will never settle down as a noble lady and will never want to lead the life that Sansa leads. Do you think Ned is the type of guy that would force her? If he had lived, if everything had been okay, do you think Ned is the type of boy that would force her to marry somebody she wasn't interested in? No, because he would go back, think back what happened to uh, with Lyanna, how they kind of forced Lyanna to marry. And look what happened there. Yeah. And especially with her looking and, you know, taking after Lyanna so much. The comparison of John and Arya, why they get along so well as outsiders. Obviously, Lyanna was the same way too. She was so much like Arya. Rather ride in a tourney than watch a tourney from the outside. Those three characters are probably a lot more alike than we'll ever know. Hopefully, we'll, we'll learn more about Liana in season eight. John, Arya, they're both outsiders, but he maybe subconsciously sees his mother in Arya, mm-hmm. which is kind of interesting. Yeah, Micah is run down and killed by the hound, Sandor Clegane. Yeah, which is. Kind of an un-Sandor Clegane thing to do. Do you think that's a bit of a plot hole? You don't think that's what he would do? I mean, he's just taking orders at that point. Yeah, but to to kill a kid, I feel like that's not... Like, Sandor would not stop somebody from doing it, but for him to do it himself, you know, even on orders from, from the Queen. And I know he's supposed to be framed as a bad man, a scary person, but I feel like if George had to write A Game of Thrones over again... You know, knowing what we know of Sandor, especially on the TV show, I don't think that that's something that he would want to do or be willing to do. And I don't think that falls under the job description of Prince Joffrey's sworn shield. So I don't know. That never sat well with me, especially the more I learned about Sandor Clegane. Either way, it's curtains for Micah. And that makes Arya hate Sandor Clegane and Prince Joffrey and Queen Cersei. She trains with Cyril Farrell, and that's pretty much her story until Ned is arrested for treason. And this is the George R. R. Martin written episode. Cyril Farrell faces down, what was it, like three or four men at arms with a wooden sword, and he tells Arya to flee. Mm-hmm. And Arya doesn't want to leave him, right? She wants to stay and fight with him. I love this line. Cyril Farrell says, What do we say to the god of death? Not today. And then Arya runs off, and somehow she makes it to. Baylor Sept, the steps of the Great Sept of Baylor. She's just trying to find some food, and then she hears commotion. People are rushing to the steps of the Great Sept of Baylor. People are saying the hand is going to be executed. It seems like a deal's been worked out. It's like the common people know what's really going to happen, that the hand is going to be executed. Do you think they know what's really it's going to happen, or they're just going up based off the first rumor going around, and not the bargain trip, and not the uh, supposed deal, so to speak? I think from an outside point of view, I think it's obvious. Like, why else would he be brought to the Sips of Baylor, like, to say his crimes and that Joffrey's the real king? I feel like they wouldn't do that at the Great Sept of Baylor unless they were going to execute him in front of everyone. Like, that's something he could be brought before Joffrey as Joffrey sits the Iron Throne at court. That'd be more like a backroom deal, which is what this is shaped to be by Varys. And I think once the small folk here that Ned is going to own up to his crimes, they figure he's going to be executed because why else would it be taking place there? We don't think that because we see the deals being made. We see the conversation between Varys and Ned, the letter that Sansa writes. You know, we see all this stuff, so we kind of believe that that's what's going to happen is Ned's going to be okay. He's going to be sent to the wall. But the small folk are like, he was arrested for treason. He tried to put Stannis on the throne and now he's going to be executed. Because it's probably happened before, you know, a similar situation where somebody's brought out. The small folk, they don't have inside knowledge. Mm-hmm. They just assume. Their, their assumption that we think is wrong is actually right. Yeah. I never really thought of it that way. I, I just... I don't recall in the TV show, you know, something something was said because that's how Arya gets to where she is in front of the Sept of Baylor. But in the book specifically, oh, they're going to execute the hand on the, on the Sept of Baylor. You know, they're saying these things, and that's why Arya goes rushing to see what happens with her father. Again, they don't stress how much time has taken place between Arya escaping the Red Keep and Ned's execution. In the book, I feel like it's longer than a week that Arya's on the streets trying to survive. She mentions that she's learned if you catch a pigeon, you could bring it to this certain person, and he'll give you a few coins for it. She can use that to buy some bread. And, and she's figured out how to survive on the streets of King's Landing for, you know, maybe a fortnight, you know, maybe a couple of weeks, but they don't stress that in the TV show. It's a question of how relevant is that to the main story? It's not really, but it's an interesting part 
of Arya's character that gauge she's at, she's learned to survive on the streets of King's Landing. Arya is a survivor, you know, first and foremost. What kind of prisoner do you think Arya would have made? Had she not had a lesson that day, had she been taken the way Sansa was and just confined to her room? Oh, she would have tried to sneak out. She would have. She, she would have made bloody hell. Yeah, she would have been a lot of trouble. That's for sure. And they wouldn't have been able to kill her because she's a noble hostage, and Rob was amassing the powers of the North. So obviously, you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna kill her. But it would have been interesting how the, how things turned out for her if she had been caught. The relationship she would have had with Tyrion at King's Landing. When Tywin got there, what he would have saw in her, if he would have tried to make use of her, give her a little more freedom, and what effect that would have had on Rob's war campaign. A whole bunch of what ifs. But she flees to Red Keep. She sees her father executed. Ned sees, what was that guy's name? Yorin? Mm-hmm. A recruiter for the Night's Watch. Ned sees him on his way to the Sept of Baylor and he whispers something in his ear, right? Yeah. The show, he says, Baylor! Me, so he would see and turn around, look, look at the, the statue of Baylor and see that there's Arya. Yeah. I don't know how necessary that was, and it's definitely not very realistic that it happens. I mean, either way, Yorn finds Arya. <laughs> I, guess, I guess it's a lot easier to, <laughs> than to say, asshole, find my daughter behind you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, at least the line made sense. Yeah. Yorn sees Arya, and that's where season one ends. She joins the recruits that he's mm-hmm. rounded up to march to the wall. That's a good last-minute plan by Ned. Have Yorn take her to the wall. He knows that John's up there. John will take care of her. Well, he'll go up back up. You know, he'll go to the wall. He'll drop her off in Winterfell. That's true. At yeah, that point, think Ned that. isn't thinking that uh, Rob's going to come down with the whole entire north. Well, didn't Varys tell Ned that Oh, his son yes, was- yes. Cor- correction, yeah. correction. I, I stand correct. Yeah. yeah. He did know that, but I still think he would take her to the freaking take her back to Winterfell. Right, because there must always be a Stark yeah. Winterfell, so somebody's going to be yeah. there. I'm sure my wife is there. Why, why, why would right. she leave? <laughs> I'm sure she's doing that. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. But then, no, he would have known that. No. Well, then then again, he should know that his wife might not be at Winterfell because he knows that his wife has already falsely uh, arrested Tyrion oh, sh- Lannister. Yeah. yeah. Ugh, Catelyn. Oh, God. Wrong move. The worst. Wrong move. The worst. Be interesting. I wish we knew more of what Arya thought of Catelyn. You know, it's like she doesn't, uh, at least in the TV right, show, she doesn't get. It doesn't seem like there's ever really. The blame's never put on her where it should be. And I guess maybe they don't know the specifics. You know, I'm sure they heard that she took Tyrion Lannister captive, but maybe they just never put the connection between that and <laughs> everything else that happened afterwards. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Catelyn, you're the worst. The worst. All right. So at the end of season one, she meets uh, she meets some fan favorites. Gendry, right? Hot pie. She meets Gendry, hot pie. Pat Block's favorite character, hot pie. <laughs> and uh, uh, and who was the other guy that uh, got that died? The blonde hair kid. Yeah. Oh, what's his name? Lami. Lami. Yeah. Was it Lami? Yeah. Lami. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yep. Her three buddies from the Night's Watch. Do we see the? Do we see Jack and Hagar in the cage? Yes. At the end of season yep. one, with Biter and mm-hmm. uh, Rorg. Although I don't know if Rorg is named Rorg. And uh, both those characters have, I think they're both, Rorg at least is still around in the books, but they're both inconsequential for the most part in the TV show. So the recruits are headed north. Yorn is really, he's the only one who's a sworn brother of the Night's Watch. Everybody else is a recruit. Sir Amory Lorch. Yeah, the recruits are attacked by Lannister soldiers under Sir Amory Lorch's command. They've been ordered by Cersei Lannister to kill Robert Baratheon's bastard, Gendry, who they know is part of the party. Obviously, Arya thinks that they're looking for her, mm-hmm. but they're not. They have no idea that Arya is... seems like Arya is an afterthought to all of the Lannisters. They have Sansa. She's the one that matters. Needle gets confiscated by Poliver, one of the Lannister soldiers. And he uses it to kill poor Lamy, Lamy Greenhands. But Arya thinks quick, and this is all Benioff and Weiss original stuff. Arya says that Lamy Greenhands was Gendry, right. the person they yeah. were looking for. Well, there he is, right there. And they take that at face value. <laughs> <laughs> she says it must be true. It was twice that the Lannister troops came. Yorn make, is able to make them march off, mm-hmm. right? Doesn't he hold a knife to Sir Amory's groin? Yeah, his groin, right. 
and they take off, but then they come back. With more men. This quick battle does not do justice to the battle it's based on in the book. Gendry figures out who she is pretty quick, or at least that she's of noble mm-hmm. birth. But Yorin's death in the TV show, I don't remember liking that too much. He was like single-handedly fighting off a few too many Lannister men-in-arms. Amory Lorch, doesn't he give him like, what do you call that? He like stabs straight down on him? Yeah. Right? Isn't it something like that with his death? Like he's just like going crazy. Like, Didn't he use one of the, the panic back shoulder, you know? Yeah. Cut right down the middle like a chicken bone down, a chicken breast down the middle. Well, it must be a painful death, but that's it for Yorin. Obviously, that's it for Lamy Greenhands. And the recruits, instead of going to the wall, they're taken to Harrenhal. It's fairly early in the Arya Stark adaptation that the story diverges from the source material mm-hmm. because Tywin Lannister this is ruling at Harrenhal. This confused the crap out of me when I read mm-hmm. the books because I saw the show first and I mm-hmm. saw Tywin was there. So when I was reading the books, I said, okay, no Tywin. No Tywin. Well, he, he was there, right, but he right, never right, saw it. Right. Okay, so I'm like, all right, there's Roose Bolton here. I'm like, all right, maybe, you know, Tywin's coming back. So every time I read one of her chapters, I'm, I'm expecting to read the arrival back to Harrenhal from Tywin Lannister. And it right. never happened. And it's hard to tell the double cross. Well, it's almost like a triple cross that goes on here because you have the brave companions involved in the book and Roose Bolton takes the castle in the name of Rob Stark. He talks about the North. He talks about Rob and Ari even mentions that the Northmen but something keeps her from revealing herself. So that's confusing because you don't really know the character of Roose Bolton yet. Mm-hmm. He's just one of Rob's northern lords. There's so many names that one name can get lost in the shuffle. And it seems like when Roose takes Harrenhal, like he's, he's ruling there for Tywin almost. On the first read, at least, that can be easily mistaken. But they do away with that. They really make it, they make it simpler. But they have Tywin and Arya develop a little bit of a respect, a little bit of a relationship, and she becomes his cupbearer. Mm-hmm. And Tywin also kind of knows that she's not the poor orphanage girl that she's trying to play herself out to be because of the way right. she says, me lady. Arya becomes privy to all sorts of interesting information and meetings. We have the meeting with Tywin and the Western lords, including the, the, new, shittiest, uh, the shittiest version uh, of- the, Yeah, by far the worst. By far the worst. What were they thinking with that? I don't know. I think they just wanted to get someone who's like taller or bigger, I guess. And they just like, yeah, you want for someone who's taller, but he's like, you also went for a guy who's probably like 80 pounds less. <laughs> yeah. But like, why even have the mountain be there at all? Like, oh, it's so not something the mountain would do. Yeah. You, you, know, you know, my favorite mountain is it's still the season one mountain. Mine too. You know, the season six was okay, but. Right. But you know, he's too young. He's way too young. And he's, mm-hmm. I mean, he looks like freaking Sandor's freaking goddamn son, not his freaking older brother. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was going to say. It's not even like Sandor's, he looks like Sandor's little brother. Yeah. It's, it looks like Sandor's son. A little yeah. cousin or something. I wonder what happened to the first mountain. What was wrong with him? What kind of acting do they think that this guy has to do where. Yeah. You know, he needs to be recast. I can almost see if they went from. The first season mountain to like season three, four mountain because maybe they, you know, fine. But, sure. But why would they make a move from season one to go to the guy from season two? I just yeah. don't know. And it's not like nobody will remember the mountain if they don't have him in season two. The only argument I can come up with for casting this guy who should not have been cast. Like being and then, Yeah. And then, and then writing the mountain as though he's like a lord in the West and. Not only that, but like an incompetent one. The only argument I can come up with for Benioff and Weiss doing that is to keep the character in the show so people remember the character. But they'll remember him from season one. And if you just have dialogue where, yeah, the mountain did this, the mountain did that. If you have nobody to play I, him, just do the dialogue. The more and, and I'm that, thinking about this, the more I'm just like, like, who was the casting director of season two? I mean, if you couldn't bring back the guy from season one, or if you wanted to try to like get someone with who's a better act, I mean, that's who you come up with. And who's the agent for the guy from season one that allowed him to get involved with <laughs> whatever project that kept him from being available for season and two of Game of Thrones? Again, they, they, <laughs> they didn't want him. So you go out and get this guy who's, what was he, six foot ten, 175 pounds? The more I think about it, this 
may be the worst part about Game of Thrones <laughs> in every single season is this the mountains season two storyline well, okay, casting you know, everything the worst casting maybe yeah I don't get by it far. I just don't I would really like to, I would love to ask D and D what happened there can someone ask D and D what happened mm-hmm. I mean I'm sure it had to be brought up what was the reasoning why did it happen who was the casting director that you know. I'm sure there was other people to maybe, you know, go after the role they picked this guy. And it's not just that, like, the casting director picked him. It's like, how many people signed off on it? Yeah. That's <laughs> ah, all right. Sorry. The, the audience, the audience ain't going to know anything. <laughs> There's no difference. And you know what? This is at a time when George Martin was on the set also. Right. Because we, we know he wasn't writing his book at this point. He's probably still <laughs> hanging out on the set. Like, yeah, you know, I wrote this, right? You think he would say something? But, but nobody. There's definitely like all of the except for like the kid roles. Instead, of like bringing the new uh, Tom and in and the, the new Marcella. Mm-hmm. For mm-hmm. the most part, all of the new recast. It's just been so blatantly obvious of recast. That's the other thing. Yeah. I mean, if you look, I, I know we're going off on you know on a completely different subject here, real quick. But like, it's okay. Yeah. Like freaking Dario. Like. <sighs> Mm-hmm. What if a guy who has no. long brown hair to a guy who's got shorter black hair? Like, oh, no difference. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I prefer Dario, too. But, yeah, he looks nothing like Dario 1. Right. You just think there'd be some sort of level of some sort of- Continuity, tr- something. You just hit the right on my head, right, right, right on my lips. Just some sort of consistency there. Like dye his hair. All right, he doesn't want to dye his hair. All right, I'll give him a wig. All right, he doesn't want to wear a wig. All right, well, then shave his head. Well, he doesn't want to shave his head. All right, then give him a cap. That makes him look bald and add a line that says he shaved his head. And like, at least in like Major League <laughs> One and Two, and they cast in Wesley Snipes as Willie mm-hmm. Mays Hayes, and then he wanted the sequel. At least they picked Omar Epps, who somewhat resembled Wesley Snipes a bit, just a tiny bit. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was still obvious it was not Wesley Snipes. But you're right, man. All of the recasting, with the exception of the Baratheon kids, are just bad out of left field. It's like they were leaning into. <laughs> A totally different character. It's, it's bizarre, right? Yeah. But, but wait, I'm just trying to think of some other ones on the top of my head right now. You also had Three-Eyed Raven. Yeah, completely. <laughs> it's not, so even, not even close. <laughs> not like, even not close. Even close. Like, you, like, you think people are going to remember the guy had long hair? Was he getting a haircut? <laughs> Were the children like, of force giving him you know, a trim? It's almost like Vince McMahon is like doing the casting. Is the casting ah, they, they won't remember. They won't remember the Nobody. fake. They don't remember what Kevin Nash at Scott Hall looks like. Give me a fake diesel and a fake razor Ramon. <laughs> we just need the name. Yeah, bizarre. Absolutely bizarre. And you know what? Come to think of it, I don't know if the season two Jack and Hagar is the same actor at the end of season one. No, it is. It is. Yeah? Yeah. All right. So then he wasn't recast, so he doesn't count. But yeah, every, everything else with the exception of the Brathians. And honestly, they only get away with that because of both characters being off screen for so long. Right. That's the only reason they get away with that. If we do a head-to-head for both recasts, with the exception of blonde hair, which, you know what, at least they have blonde hair, when the rest of these recasts is just nothing like them. So along those lines, I guess with the mountain, at least they got the height right. Well, he's taller, babe. <laughs> yeah, but that's all they got right. <laughs> oh, ridiculous. Anyway, so Arya, she sees that meeting. So she's one of the only Westerosians to see the change in the mountain. <laughs> uh and then she also sees the meeting with Littlefinger, right? Yeah, yeah. And Littlefinger kind of looks at Arya. Yeah. Like. Now, does he mention something where he recognized her? No. Or, or am I? No. He doesn't. In a later season? Nothing like that, right? I feel like Littlefinger would have recognized her. But along those lines, Arya is pretty, seems like she's pretty worried that he will recognize mm-hmm. her. He spills, she uh, spills the wine. Mm-hmm. This is, she has a very good, and she has very interesting conversations with Tywin here. Good stuff from she does. Good stuff from D and D, you know. Yeah. Tywin's yeah. question: Do you think that you know they say the rough star can't be killed, and then she says anyone can be killed? Tywin has a lot of respect for her as a cupbearer, and he even says that he knows that she's of noble birth, but he never dares to think that she could be Arya Stark. No, probably didn't even doesn't even know what Arya Stark even looks like. No, definitely not. He can just pick out that she's of noble birth. So what is the story that she gives? She's from the north. I forget what house she says she's from, mm-hmm. but it's it's like a minor. Yeah. A minor northern house that- A sub-minor. Yeah, that she hopes Tywin isn't really familiar with. So anyway, as as this is going on, and yeah, you're right, it, it, is, it is more interesting in the show that it's Tywin. I did rather enjoy the scenes together. But while this is going on, 
Jagan Hagar tells Arya that he owes her three lives mm-hmm. because during the battle between the Night's Watch recruits and the Lannister men at arms, a fire broke out and Rorsch, Biter, and Jack and Hagar were in their cage on wheels and they would have burned to death. But Arya, she tosses them an axe so they can get out. Mm-hmm. She has something. I, I, know, I can't remember mm-hmm. exactly what she does. She saves them. Yeah. They, would have, they would have burned to death if not for that. Jockin phrases it in an interesting way, which we learn more about. He doesn't say you saved three lives. He says you took three lives from the God of Death. So name three people and we'll make it happen. And these are completely different characters that she names than from the books. But she names the Tickler, who is the Harren Hall torturer. Mm-hmm. And she names Sir Amory Lorch. I don't think she names either one of them in the books. So they both end up dead. For a third name, I think she does say Tywin, right? Mm-hmm. How does that work out? Because she says Tywin, or but was- Tywin had Tywin had just marched. Mm-hmm. There's some there's some reason he can't he can't do it, or he something says something happens. Right, something happens. So instead, she names Jagan Hagar. Right, because she wants since you can't kill Tywin, help me escape. And he's like, that's not the deal. And she's like, all right, well then I'll name a third name, Jagan Hagar. That blows his mind because he he would have to do it. So instead, he helps her escape, her and Gendry and Hot Pie. As they're leaving, he offers to take Arya to Bravos to join the Faceless Men. Mm-hmm. She says, no, I got to go find my brother and my mother. So he gives her an iron coin from Bravos and says that will allow her to obtain passage to Bravos should she ever choose to do so. I think he changes his face right there. Yeah, to something completely else. Yeah, which he changes back in later, <laughs> in later seasons. That blows her mind. And that's where we leave her season two. Season three, this is where she meets up with the Brotherhood Without Banners, which again, I feel like it's a little bit more in line with the book material. Still, a lot of Benioff and Weiss original joins here. They encounter Thoros of Mir and some of the Brotherhood at a some sort of tavern where they're trying to get food. And it turns out that the Brotherhood Without Banners, some of them are men sent by Ned to restore order in the Riverlands under the command of Lord Beric Dondarrion. And I think Thoros, he's not interested in taking them hostage until the Hound shows up. And then the Hound immediately recognizes Arya and tells Thoros who she is. And Thoros decides they must be brought to Lord Beric. The Hound is in chains. Like, I believe the Hound has been captured here, right? Yep. So they all go to meet Lord Beric Dondarrion, and the Hound is brought before him. Oh, here, here's another recast, Beric Dondarrion. Right. This one is actually this one's actually definitely for the better though, but still. It's, well, it's for the better, but it's not. If you remember the guy from season one, he'd be like, "Holy, does he look like a?" Yeah, that guy sucked. I don't think he has a line of dialogue. He's just like Ned's, like this is Lord Beric Dondarrion. He's like, "Yes, yes, my lord." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll lead these men to the Riverlands and bring justice to the False Knight, Sir Gregor Clegane. He's like, mm, mm-hmm. "Okay, no problem." Yeah, <laughs> well, t- will do. <laughs> Now, which liquor again am I going to be taking care of on that? Yeah. The new Lord Beric is <laughs> drastically older, but he's got the same color hair. I guess it's the closest of the adult recasts, at least. The Hound is brought before Lord Beric and Arya accuses the Hound of murdering Micah. And somehow, all we know of the Hound, how he's framed as a bad guy, the only real case they have against him is Micah. The Hound defends it, saying, the prince ordered me, or the, did it say the prince or the queen? It was the queen that ordered, mm-hmm. right? It, it was Cersei that ordered it. There's no way that, that Joffrey ordered it. But he says, I was following orders. Lord Beric sentences him to trial by combat and loses. <laughs> the Hound wins. He kills Lord Beric, but Lord Beric comes back to life and releases the Hound. Had we heard anything about Lord Beric being killed and coming back? Well, uh... Before this, uh, in the show? Yeah. In the book, yeah, there, there was there were rumors Definitely about that. Definitely in the book. In the show, I'm not sure. And if it was, it was a very, you'd have to, I, I, I'm i going to rewatch the whole entire shows again, the episodes again. I really am going to really go on a binge watch pretty soon. Feeling it. Yeah. Maybe this is like stuff I should write down to look for. But I, I just don't think, I mean, if it was, it, it wasn't. It was like a throwaway line, sort yeah, of. Yeah, and that's yeah. something a guy in my age can remember. Yeah. I feel like Arya is not too phased that Lord Beric is rising from the dead, but she gets real angry when the Brotherhood Without Banners decides to sell Gendry. Mm-hmm. This is all Sandra, yep. This is after Gendry has sworn his sword to the Brotherhood. He wants to join them. 
and then they go and sell him to Melisandre. Benioff and Weiss' original joint, it is to take the place of Edric Storm, Mm -hmm. another of Robert's bastards who has been living with Renly. Stannis takes responsibility for him, but all he's after is Melisandre tells him to take Edric Storm because she wants that royal blood he has for spells. And it's the same thing with Gendry. So Gendry just takes the place of Edric Storm here. Arya gets real angry at this, understandably so, and she takes off. She escapes. How does Hot Pie end up where he ends up? They go to that inn where he starts making bread or something, and they realize they wanted to keep him on as a baker. He goes with them to the Brotherhood, or is this... I don't remember. Yeah, well, because it's, it's just... He gets left, he gets taken, he stays there just as... Ari and the Hound go, the Hound okay, uh, right. says, oh, I'm going to take her to, to her family's place and, you know, right. in the uh, Vale of Aaron so he can mm-hmm. get some money. Mm-hmm. Anyway, she escapes the Brotherhood and wouldn't you know it, she gets caught by the Hound who has won his trial by combat, so he's a free man, but he's got no money. The Brotherhood took it all for their own guerrilla war campaign and the Hound intends to take Arya to the twins and ransom her. To rob. That's right. I, I'm sorry. I skipped, I skipped the beat because now he had right. I skipped the beat. No, because – no, you didn't because – No, no, no. He goes to the, he goes to the Aaron. He goes to the Vale oh, of right. Aaron after yeah. I, That's I after, jumped ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I, I thought you meant in reference to Hot Pie. For some reason, Hot Pie's narrative in the TV show, it's lost to me when he went to become the baker's apprentice. But I think you're right. I think it is I – I don't think he goes to see Lord Barrack. I think he – I think he splits off with Gendry and Arya before that. Either way, it doesn't matter. It's hot pie. So season three ends for Arya with, not with the red wedding, but the hound brings her to the twins just as shit's about to go down. Arya, she comes so close to reaching her brother and her mother. Like I said, as they arrive, the Freys and the Boltons are betraying the Starks. All the Stark men are being slaughtered. In the show, show only, Arya tries to release Grey Wind. Yeah. And she actually sees him, she sees him killed. Another sad scene. And another Benioff and Weiss original joint. Arya tries to enter the twins. She tries to get inside the castle, hoping to save Rob and save her mother. And the hound knocks her out and drags her off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she still wants to fight. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's over. Well, it's also, a, I think it's also meant to parallel her watching Ned get executed, where she couldn't do anything. She couldn't do anything. She was powerless. I mean, in the book, she tries to. I think in the TV show, she, you know, she doesn't make much of an attempt, but Yorin saves her from seeing that. Here, it's like history repeating for her. She's powerless to help Rob and Catelyn, but she's going to try. And here, the Hound saves her, really saves her from herself. If she had gotten in, at best, she would have been a hostage for the Freys. Probably ended up marrying a Frey, but the Hound saves her from that fate. Season three actually ends for her. They encounter a few Frey soldiers bragging about. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they exaggerating how they killed the, the direwolf, how they took mm-hmm. Grey Wind's head off. And then she starts just, you know, killing them. The next time you do that, tell me. This isn't the first person she's killed. Because if we go back to season one and her escape from the Red Keep, she kills one of the stable boys who was going to, I guess, tell the Lannister soldiers that he found her, right? Because he would have got a, a little reward. And she kills him. Not innocent, but you know, she's trying to escape and she, she had to do it. He or she, she didn't have to kill this person, but she kills him. Understandably so. Mm-hmm. Crime of passion, premeditated. She made a decision to kill somebody. And that's it for season three. Did you like the Arya Sandor Clegane relationship in the TV show? Mm-hmm. We have the chicken episode in season four. They encounter Polliver in a tavern and Arya realizes that he still has Needle. This battle is a little confusing because Rorg and Biter are, who were in the jail cell with Jack and Hagar, have somehow joined these Lannister men. And do they start the Hound? Is that how yeah. it breaks down? Yeah. Hound's just like, I just want to eat some chicken. Yeah. But they, they, they start like telling him, like, you know, how you, uh, you ran, you fled. Right. Right. After the Blackwater. Yeah. Somehow Arya gets the needle back and she uses that to kill Polliver. Mm hmm. And then she also kills Rorg. Yeah, she kills Rorg. I think Biter sticks around. Yeah, because Biter attack the Hound. I don't know. Yeah, later on, right, he comes back in the, uh, he comes back. Towards the end of season four. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
they escape the tavern. Uh, I do believe the hound is injured, but I don't think he's – it's a horrible injury. He's well enough to take Arya to the Vale of Arryn, where he his new plan is to ransom Arya to her aunt Lysa Arryn. And as soon as they reach Bloody Gate, they're told that Lysa has jumped from the moon door and committed suicide. <laughs> and Arya just starts just laughing, laughing at this. Yeah. She's starting to take a dark turn here. To end season four, we get another – Benioff and Weiss original joint, which may be one of my favorites. Uh, they take a few liberties, which are in some ways better than what George Martin does in his story. Here, they're confronted by Brienne of Tarth and Podrick. It's just chance that brings them together. Mm-hmm. Brienne is looking for Arya. I guess Brienne was going to the Vale to see if maybe Arya went there. Brienne says, I made a promise to your mother to keep you safe. I don't think Arya says too much to her, right? Or if she does say something, it's along the lines of, you know, you didn't keep my mother safe. Right, 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 right. She's not believing it. She's like, mm-hmm. oh, how are you going to protect me? You could have protect my mother. My, mother's dead. Right. my mother's dead right now. Arya doesn't trust anybody. At least the Hound, you know, while she hates the Hound for killing Micah, the Hound doesn't lie. As Arya gets to know Sandra Clegane better... It's not that she she likes him. It may not even be that she respects him, but she knows that Sandra Clegane does have a certain sense of honor. Yeah, he's not going to share a coat or anything. As Brienne of Tarth tries to take Arya under her protection, Arya stands with Sandra Clegane, and we get a really great fight. Like, this is the fight I wish Jamie and Brienne had had in mm-hmm. season three. It's pretty brutal from what I remember of it. Yeah, they're like hitting each other with rocks and... Mm-hmm. There were some low blows involved in there. That wasn't just a fight. That was a sword fight. That was a, that was a, uh. It had a fair share of sword play. It was brutal in how they were really trying to kill each other. And the hound loses. He's pissed at that. Really, he's pissed at that. He doesn't get over it. It seems like he's dying. Like, it seems like he's mortally wounded. And he asks Arya to finish the job, to show him some mercy and just finish the job. You might think that Arya would do him that favor. But she doesn't, and it's not because she doesn't want to kill him. It's not because she feels bad for him. It's almost like she refuses to show him the mercy of of a quick death because he doesn't deserve it. She just decides not to. Mm-hmm. And it's it's pretty which powerful just, scene. Yeah, which is like in his eyes, he just wants to you know just just end it. Mm-hmm. The fact that she doesn't do it just pains him even more. Like, why are you not going to kill me? Yeah, I killed your friend, your Micah. I killed him. I butchered him. You know, try and get that emotion out of her to actually do it. Of the relationships that Arya's had thus far, going into the end of season four, it reminds me a little bit of of Luke Skywalker in that in each movie he had a new master, so to speak. Right? He had Obi-Wan Kenobi showing him things in A New Hope, and then he trained with Yoda in The Empire Strikes Back. You could argue it either way, but the Emperor tried to take that role as his master in Return of the Jedi. Going back to Arya... In season one, she has Cyril Pharrell. She's with Yorn for a little bit. I think more in the books, Beric Dondarrion has more of an effect on her, and it's glazed over a little bit in the TV show. Mm-hmm. But we certainly can't underestimate the effect that her time with the Hound has had on her. Would you go so far as to say that the Hound shaped some of Arya's characteristics as an older person, as, as, a, as a young adult? Mm-hmm. Like, definitely in the fact, like... The whole, like, not to take death, I mean, you, you gotta do what you gotta do type of shit mentality. Right. Don't trust anybody. Don't like anybody. Watch out for number one. How to survive. What I find real sad about this storyline, though, is if you look at it from the Hound's point of view, it's sad, right? Because Arya is still a young person. She's not mortally wounded. She's got that iron coin. She may not have a family left, but she's still got the rest of her life left. There's still hope for her. Whereas the Hound... His time with Arya, that was his his last chance to, to make something. Perhaps it was a pipe dream, but the idea that perhaps Rob Stark would take him into his service once he delivers Arya. Do you think that's something Rob might have done? I think, I'm th- as I'm thinking about it right now, I think that would be something his men would have want. I think his men would want him to kill him. Something tells me Mommy would have said, we can use him on our side. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I agree with you, but somehow I feel like if the hound showed up, Rob would have taken him into his service. And whether it's a decision his mom makes, obviously he would be useful to anybody he serves, unless there's fire. 
It would have been interesting. Do you think he would want to be in his service and not just and just and instead of just wandering off and yeah, yeah. Trying- well, he says I don't know if he says it in the show. I feel like he did say it in the show. You know, and Arya kind of left him off, but in A Storm of Swords, certainly, maybe your brother will even take me into his service. Maybe I'll swear your brother my sword. And Arya again laughs him off. We have to find out because they don't get there in time. Mm-hmm. A different scenario had timing been different. He had delivered Arya. Maybe if you phrase it as, instead of a ransom, can you take me into your service? I think that would have gotten raw attention. Certainly there'd be mistrust, but at the same time, he did bring Arya to him, you know? Right. You know what? I, I feel like Catelyn would have been the one to be like, we can't trust him. And Rob would have been like, but he brought us Arya. It would have been interesting though. Mm-hmm. We should have talked about that scene because they go back to it in season seven of the, I don't even know what he was. It was just a, a guy and his daughter. Oh yeah. the uh, He takes like the food away from them or something. The hound. And she feels guilty of what you do that. I'm like, they're going to die out here. We need to live. And then they come back and well, you know, they, Santa was right. They were not prepared to, to live is, like that. This has to be after the chicken scene when Santa yeah. was hurt before they go to the Vale. They take refuge in this house and then the guy says, well, you know, if you help me with some work, I'll let you stay here and feed you or whatever. He does it for a little while. But I think, I, I feel like the father, the landowner, he was dying as it was, right? Jesus. Should have done our homework. Yeah. Long story short. I should have done a canty and rewatch all seven seasons in yeah. one day. <laughs> Just the Arya scenes. Point of that part was Arya sees this as a horrible thing that the Hound did. And the Hound just sees it as survival of the fittest, basically. Yeah. They were going to die anyway. And, and a near life lesson also, too. Yeah. So, all in all, although Clash of Kings, the Storm of Swords was not adapted directly, it was a real loose adaptation. The highlight for me is the Hound and Arya. Again, it's not direct, but it's close enough. And I think the important thing is what each of these characters gets out of that relationship comes across in the TV show. That's one reunion I'm really looking forward to in season eight is The Hound and Arya. So it's all good. Seasons one through four, great storyline for Arya. And then things kind of take a turn. I don't know about for the yeah, worse. No, but they- you know, I just, you know, it's one of those things that I always remember. I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, we were talking about, you know, well, this is actually even season six. I'm really skipping ahead a lot, maybe. I, I mean, I'll, I'll hold off. Well, really, it's I, season six, right? It's a season six where she gets the, the injury. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm really, let's. Let's do this. I'll go real quick through the highlights for season five and season six, and then we'll, then we'll discuss what we got to discuss. Best part of season five is just like how, how it is in the books, where you know how they want Arya, or not Arya, Arya, if I'm going to say it right, Arya. Arya. To, um, you know, she can't have any remembrance of being Arya Stark. Right. She has to give, you know, rid of everything, her clothes, mm-hmm. her name, this, that, blah. And mostly important, yeah, she can't use needle. But she can't give away needle. Needle was, needle, that was, that was it. She had to hide it. That was just too much, mm-hmm. too much for her to give up. I'm paraphrasing from the book, but. It was raw, it was one Needle was, yeah, it was everything to her. The most important of all. It was Jon Snow. How he missed her, how she missed him the most. Mm-hmm. He used to muss her hair and call her little sister. sister. I believe it's D.B. Weiss. Yeah, it's D.B. Weiss. And this guy, when he talks, let Benioff do the talking guy. But D.B. Weiss said something to the effect of, he was describing what needle means to Arya. He's saying it represents her journey and not that it represents killing, but it represents violence and you know, what she's becoming. I could completely disagree. He, he was totally off point with it. It's yeah, as it, though he, he forgot about the key parts to Arya's story post A Storm of Swords. He was totally off with it. My God. You know, really, I, I was trying to be apologist for them, but after something like hearing something like <laughs> that, I take it all back. I mean, there's just... That, that one line of the book just tells you what needle it represents. It represents her old life. It represents Winterfell. It mm-hmm. represents how Stark. It represents all this stuff. Especially it represents John. You know, she he's the one who gave her the sword. I'm trying to actually find it. What he said because I mean the fact that John gave her the sword makes it probably more that she doesn't want to lose. Always want to get it back. Um, I can't find it. It was an interview he did. I think for season five. It was just like 
What are you talking about, dude? I don't know. That's paraphrasing what he said. I, I'm just completely, that's just, in my eyes. I mean, you know, who am I? Uh, he, well, I mean, you're, you're somebody who obviously read the book and paid attention, whereas this kind of makes me think that Benioff did all the reading and Weiss was just like, I don't know. Maybe Weiss is just like an idiot. Benioff has been carrying him this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> it's like his cousin or something. I'll go through season five and six real quick, and then we'll discuss what we want to discuss. So at the end of season four, Arya uses the iron coin. She gives it to a captain who is bringing his ship to Bravos. At first, he says there's no room, and she offers up this coin, and he says Valar Margolis, and she says Valar the Hyrus, whatever, or vice versa. But in season five, Arya arrives in Bravos, and after a few initial requests, she's finally accepted into the House of Black and White by a man who wears Jack and Hagar's face. This is Jack and Hagar. We assume. She impresses Jacken with her ability to lie undetected by convincing a terminally ill girl to drink poison. She is given the assignment of assassinating a corrupt insurance salesman, but she is distracted from her mission when Sir Marin Trant of the Kingsguard arrives in Bravos with Lord Mace Tyrell. She takes the identity of the girl she had poisoned, and she disguises herself as a prostitute and infiltrates a brothel where she kills Sir Marin. When she returns to the House of Black and White, she's caught by Jack and Hagar, and he's angry at Arya. He says that Arya has not disassociated herself from Arya Stark. As a result, wearing another person's face will poison her, and Arya is blinded. She becomes blind as Season 5 ends. Season 6, Arya is being forced to beg on the streets of Bravos. Her fellow acolyte, the Waif, arrives daily and attacks her. Eventually, Jack and Hagar brings Arya back to the House of Black and White and restores her vision. She is tasked to assassinate an actress named Lady Crane. Arya has a change of heart at the last minute and instead warns Lady Crane of the attempt on her life. The waif witnesses this disobedience and she goes to Jack and Hagar to get permission to kill Arya and Jack and Hagar gives her permission to kill Arya. Arya knows that she's in danger. She retrieves Needle from its hiding place and arranges for passage out of Bravos. The waif mm -hmm. is disguised as an old woman and stabs Arya right in the gut, mm -hmm. but Arya escapes. Lady Crane nurses her back to health, but the Waif reappears, kills Lady Crane, and pursues a recovering Arya. Arya leaves the Waif to her quarters underneath Bravos and extinguishes the only candle in the room. Her experience fighting blind ultimately gives her the advantage and allows her to kill the Waif. She removes the Waif's face and adds it to the Hall of Faces before telling an impressed Jack and Hagar that she is Arya Stark and she is returning to Westeros. Arya travels to the twins, assumes the identity of a servant girl. She kills Lord Walder Frey's sons, Black Walder Rivers and Lothar Frey, before cooking them in a pie that she serves to Walder Frey. After revealing it's a lot of time to cook a pie and not get caught. Uh, forget, well, we'll get to it. After revealing her subterfuge and her true identity to Walder Frey, she cuts his throat, thus avenging Rob and Catelyn. So, yeah, season five is not. So so bad, but season six for Arya, it's a mess, dude. It's a mess. Where do you want to start? Oh, God. You know, we talked about it when we talked about the, we did the episode review of that, the, of that episode. It just really just... Going back to season five real quick, in some ways, season five is the most direct adaptation of Arya's stuff, because with the exception of Jack and Agar, it's the kindly man. There are very little clues that the kindly man in the book is Jack and Hagar. But that's fine if they switch it out. And it's not Sir Marin Trant that Arya kills. It's, uh, what's his face? I think it's Rorg, to be honest with you. And this is from a Winds of Winter sample chapter. So it happens after she's blinded. Well, no one's with the sample chapter. She also kills the tickler. Right. That she had already killed earlier in the show. Yeah. Which, again, is, being a Benioff and Weiss original, I get why they as name recognition as a character that viewers will remember, they kept some of these characters around to take the place of new characters. And the shuffling around, I understand. But the main beats of season five are pretty much direct from the books. Season six just goes off the rails. The training on the streets of Bravos, okay, not so bad. But why did Jack and Hagar let her back in and give her her vision back? Like, what was it that made him decide, all right, she doesn't think she's Arya Stark anymore. I'm going to give her back her sight and give her a job. It was just, uh, it was like brushed over, it seemed. Like, was it that she held her own against the Waif or? <laughs> You're never going to win this, Val, but you've held your own for more than two minutes. 
So I'm going to trust you with killing, <laughs> a, you know, yeah. a noble lady, right? Lady Crane. Now, what is the deal with the waif? Why was the waif? It was like the waif had a hard on for Arya. Like she just wanted. Was it? Well, was she jealous? Like, was it because it has to do? Well, not really from the books. Well, wait, from, would be from the books? Excuse me. With Arya, is she upset that Arya has the working ability? I don't think so, because nobody knows about that. Arya doesn't really even know about that's that. That's true. That's true. But when she defeats the waif, she cuts the candle. She defeats the waif because she had trained at fighting while she was blind. In the book, there's a cat that's always hanging out. That's why she becomes cat of the canals. Mm -hmm. That's one of the identities she assumes. She is able to warg into the cat and see what's going on. And that's how she defeats the waif. They play the lying game and if the waif could tell when Arya was lying, she'd give her a whack. One time she went to give her a whack and Arya saw it was coming through the cat's eyes and was able to dodge it, you know, and, and whack her back or whatever. But there was no like heated rivalry in the book where mm -hmm. the waif wanted to kill her. I think that's the first problem with this is the character of the waif. If you're going to make this a character for two seasons that wants to kill Arya. Give us a reason. Give us a reason. Give us a goddamn name too instead of the waif. Who, by the way... But like you don't really realize it, but like in real life, she is freaking gorgeous. I was about to say, I do remember her being kind of like she looks just very weirdish, like you know, like mm -hmm. she looks waifish. <laughs> <laughs> but exactly, they they, they really waved her out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then we have the the Lady Crane storyline, which I guess is kind of based on the last Arya sample chapter oh, released, she released, in which <sighs> she's actually one of the. I think she's one of the actresses, mm -hmm. and they're putting mm -hmm. on the production mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. – what was it about Lady Crane that made Arya decide, you know what? I spent all this time trying to become a faceless man, and I couldn't forget my life, right? I still thought I was Arya Stark, so I was punished. And then I spent all this time trying to forget Arya Stark and get back the good graces of the faceless men. I finally do my first mission, and I don't want to kill this lady. What was it that she saw in Lady Crane that made her decide? You know? I wanted it. Did, she, did maybe did she remind her of her mother? That's what I think. I agree with you. And if I remember correctly, the actress that played Lady Crane, she didn't completely resemble Michelle Fairley or Catelyn Stark, but there were characteristics about her. Mm -hmm. That's the best conclusion I can come to. So okay, fine. But then we have her battle through the streets of Bravos with the Wave. And that god damn, I cannot, and I never will get past the gut wound. But that she's still like reopening oh. right now. It's like has, has not been fully recovered. Yeah, that gut, she should have died from that first of all. She, she should have died from that, and like Lady Crane isn't going to nurse her back yeah. to health. Well, she only had was like soup and water. Yeah, and that heals her gut wound. Well, like, I guess like the water. <laughs> I mean, Ned doing the show that could just give some Leanna some water. She would have been fine, also. <laughs> Is there some guess, water? We need yeah. some water that will cure everything. The healing properties of water. <laughs> but dude, like you get stabbed in the gut, like that's going into it's going into either your intestines or like so she's not even right, gonna be able to keep the soup down. It was not even just a stab, but it, it was also kind of like a stab and like a rip too. It wasn't just like yeah. a, you know. I mean, she really like so hard tied not, it in there. It's not so much the idea here, which is the wave Could gets to jump on her and. Could have stabbed her, her at least in like a non-fatal. Yes, yes, dude. You know? Yes, it's the execution of their ideas. What well, if like, just you know, like she was going for the gut, but Ari was able to jump, but was still able, but like, was guy like stabbed? Yeah, you know, let's just say like the upper thigh or something, just something that you could still see she has an injury, but it will actually heal. You know, it won't it won't kill her slowly yeah. with nothing that can be done about it, except for some chicken soup. Yeah, like you know, like like I feel like if I got stabbed in the gut right now. Like, if I'm not getting to a hospital, I'm definitely dead. And even if I get to a hospital, like, it's going to be major surgery. If I get an infection in there, at the very least, I'm going to be pretty messed up for the rest of my life. Getting stabbed in the intestines like that. They don't have an invasive surgery <laughs> where, you know, they could just sew the intestines back together. You know, whatever whatever they would do. And it's not like even she goes to see a maester. You know, she she's not going to see a healer. An actress is taking care of her. And why did the Waif wait so long? If the Waif was able to find Arya, if Lady Crane was the initial target, how do they not know where Lady Crane lives? So the Waif gave Arya time to heal before she came. Mm -hmm. And all of this stuff could have been solved with just a little adjusting of the writing. 
obviously, I blame it all on the writers, ultimately on Benioff and Weiss, because if they didn't write it, they're okaying it. The major plot points of her season six, okay, fine. But the execution, it seemed like an afterthought and it wasn't well thought out. You know, so why have her go in the first place? What did she learn over there? It looks like nothing. How to take, take a beating. <laughs> yeah, but it becomes a bigger problem even in season seven, going back to the start of our conversation about Arya Stark. It looks like she learned nothing. She barely got out with her life. The positive takeaway I can see is that she realizes she wants to be Arya Stark and she wants to go back to Westeros and fight for her name and whatever family's left to her. That's the takeaway, right? But then you get a surprise in season seven where, and not only the surprise that she's an actually an excellent assassin because she, her first solo job as I guess a freelancer is <laughs> she takes out the biggest, like not the most powerful, but the biggest, the largest amount of people, the biggest house in Westeros in House Frey. But like, how does she know where to get, like, where does she get the poison from? Where does she get the poison from? How did she cook them into a pie? Without where being did, caught. Right. Where did she do this so that she could actually serve this pie to Walda Frey? How did she get any clearance to work at this kitchen? Like, how did she get into the twins? Okay. You know what? Fine. You you want to just leave it as like, we got to figure that out? Okay. I can kind of figure it out. I can create a narrative in my head where all of this makes sense. But then you open up season seven and she kills the all of the phrase. And then she says, tell them, what is it? What's her line? And it's a cool line. Yeah. Tell them that house Stark, that tell them what the winter, winter has come, come for house Fry. Now, was that, was that a cold open for episode one? Yes. Okay. Now we know there's not that many cold opens, you know, so when they do a cold open, it's usually, it's a powerful enough scene to not only warrant being a cold open, but it's generally an important you, scene. You, real quick, do you think we get a, at least one cold opening for this season? Yes. Do I think it'll be episode one? Maybe. You know what? I'm going to think more on that, and we'll discuss it when we do our, our preview episode. But okay, I'll buy that she was able to cook these guys into a pie. No, okay. I'll buy that she was able to get the intel that these were the two phrases that were most responsible for the Red Wedding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that she was so able conveniently, she, 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 she takes out the two top ones that planted right. somehow. She was able to figure out of all the phrase which ones they were, get them alone so she could kill them, chop up their bodies, put them into a pie, bake a pie, serve that pie to Walter Frey. Because she does not have any pies all the time, too. Sure, sure. Hot Pie told her. Uh, she learned from Hot Pie, who, you know, when she last sees Hot Pie is like the shittiest baker. <laughs> Remember that dire wolf that he gives her? Yeah. All right. We'll get past all that. But then she kills all of the phrase in the cold open and she just waltzes on out of the twins. Come on. It's a nice thought. I can't even say like you can execute that better. It's just unrealistic. But okay. You want me to swallow that and accept that? Fine. It's season seven. Benioff and Weiss, they have some, you know, they got a lot of uh, political capital. You know, they have a lot of goodwill. We'll let that slide. But then all of a sudden, it turns out that while she was in Bravos, she actually learned how to fight. And not only that, she learned how to fight just like Ciro Farrell. She's a water dancer now. And her, her gut wound is a non-factor in the way she moves around and does kip-ups and, you know, spins and jumps and leaps and lunges. Stomach is no problem. Fully healed. So somehow, for me, Arya Stark goes from a character that I like a lot. And granted, in A Song of Ice and Fire, the story does get a little monotonous, a little tedious, a little bit on the boring side, especially compared to how great her narrative was, like you said, in book two and book three. Talk about like jumping the shark, you know? It, it, it just seemed where, which came to be such a believable character, well written character, even for the show, not just because of the books, but even the show mm-hmm. became such a unrealistic. Like a superhero. Yeah. Lots of leaps and bounds that just very tough to, to really. It's hard to take any of that seriously. Not that it's hard to take it seriously. It's, it's hard to believe any of that. You know, my go-to line is, this is a show with dragons and magic. So we're supposed to believe the unbelievable. Yes, but there's got to still be rules that keep this world and this story grounded in not the same reality that you or I live in, but in a reality that makes sense to what we're watching. And those rules we think they're established in season one and then the dragons hatch. All right. So there's magic. And then at the end of season two, 
we think we know everything, but then we find out more about the White Walkers. So yeah, like new rules keep coming into play in this world. But at no point would I ever think that somebody is able to do what Arya has done from season six and, and season seven. Her improved fighting abilities, impervious to pain, mortal wounds are, are not an issue. It's bad writing. It's not but thought is, out. Is she a better fighter than Jamie Laster at his prime? <laughs> uh, it looks like it. Looks like it. I can't think of one person that can beat her in a fight right now. And don't get me wrong. The visual, like I said before, the visual in the season eight trailer of what she's doing, that's great. Yeah, but that's like, awesome. Even like, so can I just comment on that real just real, sure, real yeah, quick? Sure, yeah. Go right ahead. Like, you're in a battle against hundreds and hundreds of undead creatures throwing some white walkers and God knows what else. Why the hell are you doing like trolls like that? Yeah. You know, I just, I don't, it's like, I don't hold know. on, let me do this. Meanwhile, there's like probably like two, for every person, there's probably, for every like one human, there's what? Probably five wits. Yeah. So you're going to have freaking time to, to do these trolls and these dark mole spinoramas <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> It'd be more believable if Darth Maul fell from the sky and started fighting for the Westeros Alliance, you know, cut in half. Like at the end of episode one, he keeps falling and falling and he just lands in Winterfell, stitches his body back together and starts doing those moves. In some ways, that's more believable to me than what Arya is capable of. I feel like it hasn't been picked apart enough, number one. Number two, I feel like I want to say like the non-fanatic fans, right? The non-fandom fans, the people who are excited about Game of Thrones returning. Oh, Arya is awesome. They're not putting a second thought into any of this. I don't see it mentioned among the fandom. No, they, so the, they just think it's awesome. Yeah. Oh, Arya is awesome. You know, she could fight like that. Where did she learn to fight like that? Because if she could fight like that, then you know what? The Hound should have let her go into the twins. Mm-hmm. She would have definitely saved everybody. So the rest of Arya's story in season seven, I feel like is, is wasted. And we've talked about this before. Like, that ruse to corner Littlefinger. It's it's interesting. Yeah, I was pretty much up until the episode before Littlefinger got caught. I was questioning whether Sansa and Arya, whether it was going to come to blows, whether they were going to... Mm-hmm. I didn't like it, but I was questioning it. It's a trick that Benioff and Weiss pulled for the sake of that one payoff. Great payoff when Littlefinger's cornered and executed by Arya. But at what sacrifice, at what cost... I would have much rather had real dialogue between Sansa and Arya, real dialogue between Arya and Bran, what they've been through, how they've grown, instead of this rivalry, yeah, a complete farce to trick Littlefinger. What do you think the problem is here? Where's the disconnect between Arya season one through four and then Arya season six and seven? I think it's just them trying to, you know... Maybe up to the crowd that loves Arya so much. Here we do all this awesome things for Arya with Arya. But it's almost like, to that paraphrase of, of what Weiss was saying about Needle, it's like they don't understand Arya. They did. Or maybe they were just adapting George's material real good. I don't think the character has changed that much. I mean, she's older now. She's Macy Williams is an adult. So maybe that is who Arya becomes in A Song of Ice and Fire. She can't have that youth like. The youthful innocence, you know, she's killed people. She's not innocent anymore. And that's the tragedy of Arya Stark, is that she became somebody who has no qualms killing someone else, someone who, whose primary motivation is revenge. If you think about it, that's, that's a sad thing. It's, it's tragic. George has a good understanding of that. But I feel like Benioff and Weiss are just taking that tragedy and making it, exploiting it and making it like Arya's like great at violence. She's a great fighter. Not really exploring the character of Arya Stark. Like that, they're taking Arya at face value now and being like, well, this is what she is now. She's an assassin. It doesn't make any sense. And it's frustrating. It's hard to believe who she is right now. It's cheap. I feel like it's the easy way out with Arya. So it's frustrating. The first part of the journey, you just couldn't love any more than you did. It was awesome. It was amazing. Yeah. And then it just, for whatever reason, they just went off on this extreme. Yeah, that's you know, a good way. I, I, I think extreme. what you were trying to say, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, maybe does some of this stuff happen? Does she go in for some revenge? But I think it's almost too much. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's like way overkill. It's way overdone. You know, we're making someone too potentially in, in, um, invincible. You know, mm-hmm. she can come over all this stuff and, you know, she knows all these tactics how to kill people. And we, you never really saw that, how, you know. It's like not what Arya is about. Benioff and Weiss taking these liberties. You know, they, they do such great things with this material and then they just, a total boner. Like, what are you doing? Come on, man. The Arya John reuniting that I want to see is not an assassin. The Arya that they're showing us now is a cold blooded killer. There was no warmth in Arya with Sansa or Bran because they were putting on that ruse. You know, so even all the unbelievable things that happened with her, she became somehow. At least if you if you showed Arya Stark with Sansa and Arya Stark with Bran, at least then it'd be like, okay. But at least she's still Arya. Well, I could definitely see her like being partially cold to Sansa. Yeah. But to carry it on as much as it was. Right. It was too much, man. They didn't that's grow up and learn, you know. So that's Arya Stark for me, man. Poorly thought out. Right. Taken taken for granted. Like a whole bunch of water plays. Yeah. Frustrating. Hopefully, uh, I'm still going to give Benny Elf and Weiss the benefit of doubt. And listen, I'm not so many characters in this TV show, so much to focus on, you know, so many character traits and growth for each character and, and narrative, so many things to worry about. As a whole, they've done an outstanding job. You got to give them a pass. I just wish it wasn't Arya. They still have six episodes to write the ship as far as Arya, as far as Bran. But those are, are two of the seven major characters that we're discussing. Those are, are, are two of the seven main cast members. They got to write the ship. They got to get these seven characters right. You got anything else you want to say uh, about Arya Stark? Um, I just hope to God they do the John and Arya reunion. They got to nail that. And that, that to me that that is the only uh at this point yeah it's the only re- well i think other reunions, reunions matter there's but there's a lot of reunions still to see but to me it's the it's the biggest one it's the most meaningful one mm-hmm. it should be anyway so next up is what we're going to do Tyrion Danny John or you want to do Danny Tyrion John or nah, let's do Tyrion Danny John save John for last i like it all right so Tyrion will be up next we're getting down to it Thanks for listening. Like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash The Promised Princes. Follow us on Twitter at Princes Promised. Read the Westerosi Companion at ThePrincesThatWerePromised.com. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, in the Google Play Store, on Stitcher, SoundCloud, all your major podcast providers. We're on YouTube. We're on Spotify. Subscribe. And please leave a review for the show. We appreciate you listening. And we'll speak with you guys next time.